Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. My name is Leon. And it's time, finally, to start building the first part of the UWS-1 Ultralight Airplane. The part we're going to build for the UWS-1 is the right rudder. I chose the right rudder because it's a fairly small part on the airplane. So if I happen to fail during vacuum resonant fusion or I fail during some other part of the build of the rudder, it won't be a significant loss. I can build another one. And speaking of vacuum resonant fusion, a long time ago, I decided that the build materials I wanted to use for this airplane was going to be carbon fiber and foam composite sandwich construction. And the method I decided I want to use for fabricating the composite materials is using vacuum resonant fusion on molds. Now mold is kind of the negative of what the part's going to be. Let's say on the rudder we've got a whole lot of convex parts. The mold is going to be concave, so the exact shape of the rudder, but the negative of it. But in order to build that mold, we need something to have that negative shape. And one way to do that is build a plug. So a plug looks a lot like your finished part. And then you build your mold on the plug. Fortunately, the mold can be made out of just about anything. It has basically two requirements. One is that you want to have a very, very smooth surface finish on your plug. And that's so that the surface finish on your mold will be nice and smooth. And thus you'll have nice and smooth surface finish on your part. And that'll make it much easier to pull the part off the mold and to pull the mold off the plug. The other characteristic that your plug should have is that it should be stiff enough to hold its shape while you are building the mold on the plug. Now there are a few other little nitpicking characteristics, but we'll get to those as we're building this plug for the right rudder of the UWS-1 airplane. Like I said, you can build the plug out of just about anything, but I decided to take advantage of some of the scraps I have laying around the shop. And that's gonna drive a little bit of how I'm gonna build this plug. For example, I have some of this three quarter inch insulation foam. I have a whole bunch of this left over from a previous project. So I'll be using some of that. Also, I have a four by eight sheet of this one and a half inch thick insulation foam and I'll be using quite a bit of that here in this project. That kind of takes the bulk of the plug, but I need something to help form the foam. I'm gonna need some templates. I just took a old entertainment center out to the curb last week and a few days later, I realized, you know, that old entertainment center has a whole lot of useful thin and thick wood and plywood in it that I could actually use for templates and structural parts for the plug. <laughs> so I pulled that thing back in and tore it apart and salvaged a whole lot of great material out of it. And just kind of a spoiler for what's coming up in this video and the next video, by the way, since this is going to be more than a one part video. Um, here's a template for some foam for cutting out plan forms. And here's a template for cutting out the airfoil shape for the rudder. I also need to have a method for keeping the rudder rigid, kind of the, long, the longitudinal axis. Now I could have made a spar out of this fiberglass, and that's not a bad idea. But I didn't really want to do that, at least on this one. I might do it on the left-hand rudder. But I decided to take advantage of some tubing scrap that I have around. For example, this half-inch 4130 tubing. Now, this is kind of expensive tubing for what I'm going to do, but I'm going to use this tubing as the backbone of the rudder. I will run two holes down through this rudder plug and put this tubing down in the hole to help give some rigidity to the plug. Another alternative I have, which is a little bit cheaper, is I have some scrap one half inch metal conduit. So that would be another thing to do. I just have to make sure it's straight. That conduit always doesn't come in straight lengths and you might have to just do a little bit tweaking to keep it straight. Another goal that I had for this plug is to use some fairly simple construction methods to make the plug. I have a CNC router, which I could use. I probably will use on future parts, but at least for this first plug, I wanted to go ahead and use some simple methods for making it that anyone can do. Uh, I'll utilize fairly common shop tools, not these really expensive CNC router machines. And I'll go through the step by step as I do this, just to show you that it can be done fairly easily. Like I said before, I think this is gonna be a multi-part video. In this part, we're gonna go over the plan for building the plug, and I'll show you some of the execution of the plans that I've already started. Let's get to it. Let's do a quick review of the shape of the rudder. And if you want to know the details of how we got to this shape, I'll put a link to a video up here in the upper right hand corner. 
to the USW-1 Design Rudder Shape Part 2 video. I want to do all the work on the rudder for this plug using FreeCAD, but as I was doing some slicing and dicing in FreeCAD on the rudder shape to try to get some airfoil shapes, FreeCAD was having some problems. And so I had to give up on that for now until FreeCAD fixes the, that problem and I've switched over to another CAD program. So this is the plan form for the rudder. Over on the right hand side we had the leading edge. On the left hand side the trailing edge. Let me turn it up here. This is the bottom. You can see the airfoil shape and here on the leading edge you can see the elliptical shape. And again here's the top side and once again you can see the elliptical shape on the front or the nose of the rudder. And then let me zoom in here on the trailing edge and you can see where I cut off the trailing edge just so it won't be quite so sharp and be vulnerable to being damaged. Since I had decided to use this pink foam as the bulk of my plug, I want to do a little experiment. If you've ever dealt with foam in the past where you've glued foam together and you've got your glue, whether it's epoxy or something else, all the way up to the edge of the foam or to the face of the foam, or if you've glued foam to wood or something like that where invariably whatever you're gluing to is harder than the foam, if you've tried to sand the foam right at the juncture of your foam and your harder object, invariably you're going to get a little bit of a divot or a pit right next to your hard object. That foam always just kind of gets sanded a little bit deeper right there near that edge. I had received a tip somewhere and I wish I could remember where that using drywall mud is a good way to fill in little divots and openings in your foam. It's very soft to sand just almost as easy to sand as the foam is. I thought, you know what, that might be a good thing to use. I've tried epoxy fillers, really lightweight fillers in the past, and those haven't worked very well for me. So I want to try this lightweight drywall mud. What I've done here in this picture is I've taken a razor knife and I've cut kind of a chisel-shaped slot here in the foam, and then I used some 60-grit sandpaper to sand a kind of a divot in here. What I'm going to do then is fill it with that drywall mud. Here I have used a spatula and some lightweight drywall mud that I got from Home Depot to fill in this crevice, this chiseled crevice, and this sanded in divot that I put in here. And you'll notice I only did half of it. I had another experiment that I wanted to run over here. I wanted to uh, try another alternative, which would be filling epoxy with charcoal dust. I happen to have a whole bunch of charcoal dust left over from some other project I was working on. And so I filled the uh, epoxy about three to one with charcoal dust being the three and the epoxy being one. That's by volume. And let me give you a little picture of that. So here's what it looks like. It looks a little, a little bit like coal tar. Uh, but that's what I used to fill in these crevices over here. And I'm not even going to bother to show you any more of that. Well, I guess there is another little clip here in a moment. You'll see it. But it was very similar in sanding ability to epoxy with uh, glass microbeads, which means it's kind of hard. So I figured that wasn't going to work very well. So I abandoned that idea. Although I may do a test to see how lightweight it is, because if it's lightweight, it might work as a good bead in corners to kind of fill in. And I need to do a structural test on it too for that kind of fill. But as far as filling in foam to just kind of fill in gaps, I don't like it. At least not on this plug. I did not capture it on film or take a picture of it, but I did sand this using a sanding block. And it sanded very well. I didn't have any trouble with the foam sanding away much faster than the dried mud did. So I was pretty pleased with that. And since it seems to work pretty well, I'm going to go ahead and fill any divots or holes or cracks in the foam with this mud and uh, we'll see how well it goes. I do do another test here a little bit shortly that you'll see where I put down some fiberglass on this just to see if there's any swelling in it with the epoxy resin and we'll get to that. And speaking of fiberglass, I've decided I'm going to put a surface covering on the plug out of fiberglass. And the reason for that is the foam by itself, of course, just putting like a primer and then trying to gloss that would never work. The foam would give out too easily. It'd get punctured, dented. Even if I put an epoxy-based gel coat on it and then 
polish that, I still think it would be too fragile. So I need to put something on it to toughen it up so it can be handled. And probably one of the cheapest ways is to just put some fiberglass on it. So I decided I wanted to run some experiments here to see what I wanted to use. And I numbered these so I could kind of remember what they looked like a little bit later after I do some testing on them. Number one here is just a thin fiberglass veil. I thought that would probably be the minimum I could do to try to toughen up the foam core skin. Number two is the veil but with a peel ply on it. Number one would give me kind of a rough finish. Number two should be give me a fairly smooth finish with the peel ply put down on there. Number three is about the cheapest fiberglass that I could find at Composite Envisions where I get most of my composite supplies. And then number four is fiberglass with the peel ply. So number three, if I just did resin by itself and then squeegeed off, I would get the texture of the fiberglass coming through and I would have to do some filling on it. I thought with the peel ply on here, we might get a fairly smooth texture. So we'd give that a try. Number five is two layers. One was with the cheap fiberglass underneath and then one with the veil on top. And I did two of these because I wanted to do a couple different tests. And then number six is basically number five, but with some peel ply on it. So the cheap fiberglass, the veil, and then the peel ply. For the epoxy I decided to use on these samples, and I'll probably also use on the plug, if I'm happy with it, and so far I have been, is about the cheapest epoxy that I could get from Composite Envisions. Oh, and by the way, here's that cup of that uh, epoxy mixed with charcoal. Man, it is dark. For the plug, I'm not going to do any vacuum bagging and definitely not doing any vacuum resin infusion. I'm just going to squeegee the epoxy onto the fiberglass and then if I'm going to use peel ply, I'll put peel ply on it and then just let it cure. I wanted to find out if this epoxy has an amine blush on it. That'll kind of determine how much cleaning I have to do afterwards if I don't use a peel ply before I can do filling and painting on it. Here again, we can see that piece of foam that I put the drywall mud on and I sanded it using this sanding block over here. This is a fairly flat sanding block and I think it worked pretty well. Uh, the uh, little scratches that were in the foam got filled in nicely. This big chisel cut filled in very well and this divot that I sanded in, even the, the little setting lines along the edges filled in nicely. So I was pretty happy with that. And here you can see that epoxy mixed with charcoal that I put in here and I did some sanding on it and it did not sand very well at all. So I kind of gave up on that. I also played around with a couple other things on here. I played with the Scotch-Brite pad. Um, that didn't work at all well. It just did not give me a uh, nice smooth, well, I guess it gave me a smooth sanding, but it didn't give me a flat or the contour that I wanted. It just kind of went with whatever the natural contour of the mud was. It just kind of made smooth lumps. I also have a smaller sanding block up here that I used, and it was really too small for this kind of situation. Over here is the squeegee that I used and applying the epoxy to the fiberglass samples that we're going to look at right over here. Let's take a look at those fiberglass samples I made. Here's number one, which was that thin mesh. It's got a fairly rough finish on it, but I expected that. And the number that you see here is how thick it was. I measured it. It's a 28 thousandths. It was a little thicker than I expected. Uh, here's number two. This is the mesh with just the peel ply on it. Still fairly thick, but it did have a nice surface finish on it. Here's number three, which is single layer of epoxy. And you can really see the texture there coming through. And it's pretty thin. It's 15 thousandths. I squeegeed it pretty well. Number four, number four is that single layer of fiberglass with the peel ply on it. And it's pretty thin at the 13 thousandths. Number 5A is the combination of a single layer of the plain weave fiberglass and a layer of the thin veil. Number 5B is the same thing, except I also did a little filling in of the veil surface with some of that sheetrock mud. And then I did some sanding on it, but I neglected to clean that surface first. And so I think there was a little bit of an amine blush or something on there I should have cleaned off first because the mud didn't want to stick to it very well. And then number six is that plain weave and the veil, but this time I put the peel ply on it. All the peel plies had a fairly nice surface finish, except a few of them had kind of pinholes. 
so I'd still have to do some kind of filling on that surface. After those experiments with those pieces of fiberglass, I decided on a slight change to my experiment. On this foam, where I used the drywall mud to fill in the crevices and the deep areas, I decided to have one layer of that cheap fiberglass over my whole experiment area, and then a second layer over just half of it. And that's it. So I wouldn't use that fiberglass veil, and I wouldn't use the peel ply. Not having that second type of fiberglass makes things a little bit easier. I don't have to order a second type of fiberglass and I don't have to store it. And this plain weave fiberglass is a little bit cheaper than that thin veil. And I can save money by not using peel ply. If I can get a, a decent surface finish, in other words not having that nasty amine blush, then it should be fairly easy to clean off the surface finish and then fill in the fiberglass weave with some more drywall mud and then sand that down. After the epoxy had cured, I used an old t-shirt soaked in denatured alcohol to clean off any possible amine blush and dust off the top of this test sample I did with one layer of fiberglass on one part and two layers on the other part. I did quite a bit of scrubbing on this. The fiberglass has quite a bit of texture to it, so uh, I wanted to scrub quite a bit to try to get down in there and get it cleaned as well as I could. Next, I got some of that drywall mud and spread on there using a plastic spatula. And that went pretty well. It seemed to fill the texture very well and it seemed to stick pretty good. So I was very happy with that. Then I used a small setting block. I believe it had 220 grit sandpaper. That's just what it happened to have on it. And I used that to remove the excess dried drywall from the fiberglass surface and that seemed to work great too. So at the moment, I'm pretty happy with it. Now, I haven't finished testing it yet. Of course, I haven't put a primer on it to see how well that sticks, so that would be the next test. But uh, I won't get to that in this video. So we've come up with a few answers for what we're going to do in the construction of this plug. One is that we're going to use this pink foam for the bulk of the plug. The other is that we're going to use at least two layers of fiberglass. And we'll use that inexpensive fiberglass. So the next question is, how am I going to shape this foam? If this were a plain tapered rudder, in other words, this leading edge was a straight line, trailing edge is a straight line, and the airfoil between the bottom and the top was a simple linear extrapolation, then it would be easy. I could just make a template for the bottom, a template for the top, and then I'll just hot wire it around, and we'd be done. Unfortunately, we have complex curves on this, particularly since we have this curved trailing edge. That means it's gonna be complex. And in addition, if you look at it from the front, you can tell that the maximum thickness is not a straight line either. So it's a fairly complex curve. Well, one way to deal with that is to cut the rudder up into smaller shapes. And then we could just do, again, straight tapers between each section and then glue the sections together. And that's certainly a viable option. The problem with that is that it's gonna cut out more foam than I want in between the templates because the compound curve. Now, I can deal with that by putting filler in and just doing a very careful job of sanding, and that may be what I end up doing. The other problem, though, is when I have a convex curve, let's say out here, let's say down here at the bottom, if this actually came out like this, then I would have more foam in between the sections. The hot wiring would leave a gap in here where the real curve would curve down, but the hot wire would make a straight line, so I'd have excess foam. So I'd have to sand that out. And that's certainly doable, not a big deal. I'm gonna tr try a little something this time that I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna cut my rudder up into four inch sections and eight inch sections. Where you see these thicker lines, from this thick line to this thick line, that's eight inches. And then here's another eight inches, eight inches, and then I'm using four inches and four inches. The reason for that is as I'm sanding this, I wanna see if my sanding technique gets me pretty far off the mark on this wider section. If I can do eight inch spans without any trouble, and I should be able to, then I won't do four inch spans, at least on these fairly straight sections. Now, anywhere I have significant curvature, I will do smaller sections so that I don't have as much foam I have to try to guess at in removing. But these straight sections, I should be able to do wider spans of foam and still be able to fairly accurately sand it. At each of these sections, I'm gonna make a template. So there's gonna be a template here, a template here, 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 and here. And these end caps you can think of as templates also. 
on these end caps, I'm making them half inch wide. The fiberglass will then come up and cover these end caps a half an inch, and that should tie those in rigidly to the fiberglass. These templates, at the moment, I'm going to make out of eighth inch plywood. That's what I got left over from tearing apart that entertainment center. In fact, those half inch end caps are from the entertainment center also. Now you can kind of ignore this line here. That's not how I'm going to cut the foam. Well, it's time to start talking about how we're going to cut out this foam. Now here we're looking at the plan form of a section of foam. Now the distance between these planes, which I've used to slice up the foam, is four inches apart. So from this line to this line is eight inches. This is the trailing edge of the rudder. This is the leading edge of the rudder. Over in this direction is toward the top of the rudder, and of course that means this is toward the bottom. What I plan to do is to make a template that is this exact outline. What I'll then do is lay the template on a block of foam and cut out these edges, and that will give me the plan form for the block. Now something to point out here is that you can see that this line here isn't all the way up to this blue line. And that's so that I can leave a template in my foam block. But really this is cut out for the airfoil template that goes to the next block up. And the template that's going to be used here for this one is cut out of this block down here. The next thing I will need to do is cut out the airfoil shape out of the foam block. Once I've cut out these plan forms, I should have fairly square faces over here on this side and over here on this side. What I think I'm going to do is I'm only going to put a form on this face here. As I said, I'm going to be cutting the space out of the next block, like I did here for this one, so that when we glue them together, we have room to leave the form in there. I'm trying to imagine this foam block not having this airfoil cut into it yet. It'll be a nearly rectangular-ish uh, hunk of foam that has the plan form cut into it. So this back edge, the leading edge, this face, and the opposite face will already be cut into it. But it'll have a big flat top and a big flat bottom still. I'll cut out a template that is the correct airfoil from the big end of the section. By the way, this is the big end, so toward the bottom. This is the narrow, narrower end, although it's a little harder to tell in this uh, diagram. I'll glue the template to this face of the block. I will then use a vertical hot wire cutter and place this down flat on the table and then run the hot wire around the edge to get this airfoil shape. So that means this one airfoil shape will be for the whole thing, which means there's excess foam back here at the narrower end. I will also then bore a half inch hole down through these two holes in the template so that my supporting rods will be able to run through. And once I have that done, I'm gonna glue all the sections together. So the rudder then will kind of be step shaped. It'll be fat on the bottom and it'll step down a little bit and be the same thickness and step down a little bit, be the same thickness and so on as far as the maximum thickness goes. It's at that point I start using a flexible sanding block to remove the excess foam and sand down to my forms. That gives you kind of an overview of how I plan to put this plug together. I'm going to save the details for part two, and I'm pretty sure there'll be a part three where I'm doing the fiberglass, uh, filling it, and fairing it, and then putting a nice smooth finish coat on it. Well, I need to get back out in the shop and make myself a hot wire cutter so I can start cutting some of this foam. So stay tuned for part two.